when it went off instantaneously. I couldn't believe it was a mine um, because as far as I was concerned, we cleared it. During the Vietnam War, Australian troops laid one of the largest minefields in Southeast Asia. As I turned, of course, no one appeared to be standing. Everyone was either horizontal on the ground or horizontal in the air. They sowed mines in their thousands, then reaped tragedy as hundreds of Australians were killed or wounded by those same mines. The thoughts of Jacko laying on my legs and bleeding to death there really haunted me for a long, long time. This was Australia's most significant military blunder since the Second World War. In rural southern Vietnam, 30 years of peace has let people restore the gentle rhythm of their lives. There is little to remind them that this hill, called Nui Dat, was once the main base for Australia's fighting forces. From the base, the Australians would try to take control of Phuc Thuy province from the Vietnamese communists, the Viet Cong. In 1966, the Australians occupied the hill and established the Australian Task Force Base. More than 30,000 Australian soldiers were stationed here over five and a half years. There was a monsoon, uh, there was mud everywhere. To start with, we only had our plastic hoochies to sleep in. We'd go out on one-day patrols, three-day patrols, and then come back and have to do work in the camp because nothing was there. The squadron was virtually overworked. Putting in roads, drainage, toilets, all of the basic necessities of life. We got rations sent to us, particularly fresh rations, when we didn't need them, when we didn't want them, because we had no refrigeration. So it was very difficult. For more than a year, Australia had fought side by side with America in a divided Vietnam, trying to stop a communist takeover of the South. But concerns that the US Army was foolhardy and dangerous had driven the Australians to seek an independent role in Phuc Thuy province. In January 1967, a new task force commander arrived at Nui Dat, Brigadier Stuart Graham. He was about to take over the most demanding job in the Australian Army. Brigadier Graham was a complex character. He was highly intelligent. Um, I think he was ambitious. He would also be extremely tenacious, and when he got his teeth into something, he, he wouldn't sort of let go. Brigadier Graham was a marvellous soldier. He was a thinker. He had the ability to read the situation much better than anybody else. The situation he saw was half the people in the province lived in a group of villages around the main rice plain. They had a harvest due soon, and that rice had to be kept from the Viet Cong. The Australian base was set up to protect these villages from an enemy entering from the north and northeast. Brigadier Graham was also aware the Viet Cong were in the Long High Hills and lurked in a large strip the Australians nicknamed the Long Green. And he sees the vital area in the province as the Long Green because that's the area in which he sees the 
enemy coming across and you can stop them there, you can cut their links with the villagers and then they will wither on the vine, was the expression they were using, because they wouldn't have access to rice and recruits and so on. Soon after his arrival, Graham attended a medal ceremony for the heroes of the Battle of Long Tan. That battle, a chance encounter with the enemy five months before, had just saved the base from being overrun. It was a stark reminder of the vulnerability of a base that was undermanned and under-resourced. The size of the task force in terms of manpower was nowhere near enough to do the job that it was being given. So we asked Army Headquarters for another battalion. We asked them for some tanks. Army Headquarters said no. We looked at the situation and with the lack of troops, the only thing was that we had to put up some form of barrier. What form of barrier? We could put a, a barrier of fire, of artillery or mines. The use of mines was a sensitive issue. Only weeks before, near the Long High Hills, an Australian armoured personnel carrier was blown up in a Viet Cong minefield, laced with stolen M16 mines. The survivors were shocked by the devastation. And, of course, a great deal of chaos ensued. They were wounded everywhere. A lot of screaming was going on. Everybody felt, gee, we're getting close to the end of our tour and now this mine warfare's on. Um, maybe we're not going to make it after all. Eight soldiers died. Eleven were wounded. The incident shook the battalion and hardened the views of senior combat officers. Many officers, in fact, in the task force who had been in Korea um, had a strong aversion to mines. One of them was Colonel War, the CO of the 5th Battalion, who was wounded in Korea on a mine. Despite these warnings, Brigadier Graham decided on a barrier minefield. He sprang his decision on the man who would have to build it, Major Brian Florence, the engineer commander. I think it would be fair to say that he was appalled. Uh, a, that he hadn't been consulted. B, he had a, an innate hatred of mines. They are a very two-edged weapon. It was an illogical progression of preventing the enemy getting into money, food and medicine. Construction of the minefield began with fence building. Graham's plan was two parallel fences, 100 metres apart and 11 kilometres long. Between the fences, a sea of mines would be laid. The fence headed south from the permanent artillery base called the Horseshoe and skirted villages like Dat Do. It was built to offer protection to villages that had nurtured secret communist groups for more than 30 years. They became uneasy about this new barrier. Chúc không được thì đâu có làm sao mà nói với đồng bào là lo vận động lương thực, thuốc men, tiền bạc. Lần vấn đề trước tiên là các ông định chia cắt giữa quân và dân. Mà quân và dân như nước với cá, phải không? Mà mấy ông tạc ngăn cách rồi thì cá lấy gì sống.
The children came out ostensibly to ask for rations or put their hands out. It wasn't until days later we realised that they'd been watching us. Anh em nó cũng thấy là uh, một cái chướng ngại vật, cho nên là kiên quyết phải phá cái hàng rào này. On April the 6th, Private Paul the Forest came back from the Dat Do market to find his mate Teddy Lloyd dead. Well, his backbone was concertinaed up into his neck. Apparently, what had happened, he'd continued banging the star pickets in and trod on one of those jumping jack mines. Lloyd was the victim of an American-made M16 mine. The Viet Cong had stolen it from another minefield and during the night set it on the fence line. This was the mine Brigadier Graham was planning to sow in its thousands. The engineers, or sappers, began mine laying in late April 1967. Nobody had any prior experience. None of the sappers, none of our senior NCOs, none of our officers. Nobody had prior experience laying a minefield. We were still on the job training. Mines were laid with teams widely separated to minimize casualties. An M16 can kill up to 30 meters and inflict shrapnel injuries up to 100. The mine is triggered when its prongs are knocked or pushed down. What does the real damage is the cast iron shell that weighs about two and a half kilos inside. And this cast iron shell leaps out of this tin can that surrounds it comes up to about waist height and then explodes, but it explodes because it's cast iron into thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny fragments. If you're near the blast, the blast is so big that it can tear lumps of flesh off you, it can tear your buttocks off, it can tear your calf or thigh off, and if it doesn't completely dismember you, it does such tremendous damage that you die of blood loss within a short period of time. Stolen M16 mines were a favorite weapon of the Viet Cong. They were easy to lift and simple to set. The big issue is minefields have to be covered by observation and fire. To cover an 11 kilometre minefield by observation and fire, you would have needed several battalions. Not only um, you, would you have needed the forces, you would need them properly installed in uh, uh, posts which had the observation and which could um, organise interlocking arcs of fire for the whole distance. Graham had a protection plan. Task force officers thought it was ridiculous. The notoriously unreliable South Vietnamese government army were to patrol the western side of the minefield. Australians were supposed to patrol the eastern side. As a backup, the plan was to booby trap every M16 mine with an anti-lift grenade. A spring-loaded switch was screwed into the grenade. It was Graham's insurance against the Viet Cong stealing his mines. This was going to be a very dangerous operation. You had to use two people to lay each mine with the anti-lift switch. One person just didn't have enough hands. Once the mine was placed on top of the anti-lift grenade, pressure had to be applied as the grenade safety pin was removed. Any movement of the mine, more than three to five millimetres, would result in a, a massive explosion, and because it was a two-person operation, that would be two soldiers that would be killed. I 
can still see to this day the perspiration exploding on the forehead of my partner. You were very hot, very uncomfortable, and facing death. While the intention was that we would lay a thousand mines a day, we were nowhere within that kind of capability from the outset. Attempting to reach Graham's target of a thousand mines a day put enormous pressure on the teams. Ashley and I did our set quota. The staff sergeant, he gave me a serve for dragging the chain. On that, I looked across and I saw my partner, Ashley, was squatting down at a mine. I thought, oh my God, he started already. And I went towards him, and last thing I knew, I was blown up. The mine accident killed two soldiers and injured three others. The advancing minefield cut the Viet Cong's lines of communication. The Viet Cong needed to cross the minefield. One of the first to breach it was a young courier.